everyone. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Regent Bailing. Here. Regent Peterson. Here. Regent Atwell. Here. Regent Delgado. Here. Regent Evers. Here. Regent Greeby. Here. Regent Hall. Regent Jones. Here. Regent Klein. Here. Regent Milner. Here. Regent Mueller. Here. Regent Peterson. Regent Plant. Regent Ring. Here. Regent Style. Here. Regent Tyler. Here. Regent Whitburn. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Before we consider any items on today's agenda, are there board members who wish to declare any conflicts of interest with today's open session agenda? Regent Evers, so noted. Regent Style, any other conflicts? Those are both noted for the record, and thank you, Regents. Moving on, the minutes of the August 23rd and 24th, uh, 24th 2018 Board of Regents meeting have been provided. May I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes and thank you. The report of the Wisconsin Technical College System Board has been provided. Regents, any comments or questions on that report? Seeing none, we'll get formally started. Thanks again to Chancellor Ford and her team for her great hospitality. It's always a privilege to come to this campus. It's a privilege to have been here yesterday and today and take part of their 50th anniversary celebrations. Chancellor Ford, congratulations and best wishes for the next 50 years. <laughs> Following up on the Guardians Initiative presentation we heard at our last meeting, Chancellor Ford and Regent Vice President Peterson have co-signed an op-ed on the broad value of higher education and the UW system within Wisconsin. The op-ed will appear in regional media this weekend. Next week, Chancellor Van Galen and myself will also be doing an op-ed. The plan is to put these out on a regional basis, and if regents and chancellors, uh, please know we're looking for advocacy in other parts of the state, so please let President Cross or Jess Lathrop know if you're interested. With this in mind, uh, I will go ahead and close my report and turn to President Cross. Well, good morning and thank you, Regent President Bailing. <clears throat> With the new academic year well underway, <clears throat> I would like to report out on our uh, preliminary enrollment numbers. To be clear, these are preliminary numbers, so they may change. But it is important that we understand this snapshot of the current land landscape. Our 13 institutions, including the two-year branch campuses, serve nearly 171,000 students this fall. These students are members of communities from Superior to right here at Parkside. Our students are the core of what we do, why we exist, and how we as a public institution of higher education transform this state. Our impact beyond numbers, <clears throat> goes beyond numbers. We see it in individual stories. You'll hear one today from Siva. <clears throat> that change neighborhoods, communities, cities, states, and entire economic sectors. <clears throat> Without putting a shadow on our impact, the plain fact is we are down about 1.5% versus last year's headcount. Given Wisconsin's strong economy, particularly our record low unemployment numbers, and the shifting demographic trends that directly inform our restructuring, I believe our institutions are facing enrollment headwinds better than the numbers might suggest, particularly in contrast to the much larger enrollment drops seen by our, state, our state's technical colleges, our independent colleges, and our high schools. Keep in mind, our net number is not the whole picture on enrollment. Some campuses are up and others are down. I urge our chancellors who face enrollment challenges to continue their work to recruit and retain Wisconsin's best and brightest as well as students from around the country and around the globe. To those chancellors whose numbers are up, keep going. Don't rest on your laurels. Share lessons you've learned about driving numbers up with your fellow chancellors, their provost, and their frontline recruitment teams. Wisconsin thrives when our campuses are full of students who drive our state forward. So I welcome the nearly 171,000 students who are now part of the UW family. I look forward to welcoming even more students in the future. 
Just as important as getting students into our institutions are the efforts to help students successfully graduate and connect with careers that are professionally and personally rewarding. Outcomes matter, and we are focusing attention along the, the entire educational pipeline. So speaking of student success, it's now time for the student spotlight. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Siva Shankar, a senior physics major here at UW Parkside. Last spring, Siva was voted the best undergraduate presenter at a meeting of the American Physical Society hosted by Ohio State University. His presentation, Dampening, Damping of a Single Pendulum Due to Drag on Its String, was selected from a field of about 90 presenters from all over the United States, including students from MIT, Caltech, UW-Madison, and UCLA. It is also worth noting that UW Parkside's physics department is undergoing quite a boom. Since 2014, the number of six, uh, physics majors has increased from one to 26. So please join me in welcoming Siva. Siva, please. So first off, I'd like to thank Chancellor Ford for giving me the opportunity to be here today and attend this meeting. I'd also like to thank the Board of Allegiance for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all and tell you a little bit about my story and, more importantly, boast a little bit about Parkside. Um, so as President Klaus said, my name is Siva Shankar. I'm a senior here at Parkside majoring in physics with minors in biology, chemistry, and mathematics. I see those faces, it is not a fun curriculum. I 100%, <laughs> I will agree to that. Um, a little bit of backstory though, I was actually, I've lived in Kenosha basically my whole life. I've gone to elementary school, middle school, and high school here. So when it came time to apply to colleges, needless to say, I didn't want to be in Kenosha any longer. Um, I, I ended up applying to UW Parkside, but only because my parents wanted me to at least give a chance to the school that I basically lived with in my backyard my whole life. So I applied, um, and you know, I've, a little more backstory, I've had the opportunity to speak at some campus events before, so I see, I see a lot of familiar faces. A lot of people here don't know this about, about me, including Chancellor Ford, and I'm kind of nervous because I don't know how much trouble I'm going to get in for saying it, but UW Parkside was not my first choice in school. <laughs> it actually wasn't even close to the top. Um, I applied to a lot of different colleges, and I got into quite a few programs, and I, when it came time to decide, I was pretty much set on going to Madison. I had, uh, applied, in, I had applied and gotten into the biomedical engineering program at UW-Madison straight out of high school. I thought that was an amazing opportunity, and I should take use of that. But I ended up coming to uh, a single meeting at Parkside with the, at the time, to the health director, Dr. Brian Lewis. And it was in that one meeting, I think it was about 45 minutes, and I was just so convinced of how much the professors at this university care about students and they want them to succeed. Student success is huge here. And I, and I could tell that within the first 45 minutes. So I took a chance. I decided to come to the school that I didn't necessarily want to come to. And uh, you know, a school that wasn't near the top of my list, but I decided to show, show up here anyway. And I'm so unbelievably glad I did. Uh, see, I've, I've achieved a lot during my time here at Parkside. Um, what one of uh, the most recent, which having been uh, getting to join the Office of Admissions and New Student Services as a new student orientation leader this past summer, and so in that position, I actually got to meet and get to know in individually each of the I think it was about 1,200 incoming students that we had this past semester. Whether that be whether they be first year students or transfer students, I got to meet them all and talk to them. And that's an opportunity that I'm never going to forget. Uh, before that, though. Most of my achievements lie in the realm of physics. And I want, I want to thank uh, President Klaus again, because he did actually say some of the stuff that I wanted to talk about, unfortunately. <laughs> but when I came in in 2014, I was, and I declared my physics major, I was the only physics major on this campus. The only physics major on this campus. <laughs> the program was almost non-existent. Um, and so I was kind of nervous about declaring that major. But I went with it. 
And as President Klaus said, uh, uh, just this morning I was informed that with a couple new declared majors, we have almost 30 declared physics majors on this oh. campus. Mm. We have one to 30. Like, <laughs> It's, it's unbelievable. The program has grown exponentially. And you know, although I'd love to take some credit for that and pretend that you know, I'm just spreading my love for physics to the world and all that, it's actually thanks to the faculty here. Um, you know, all the faculty here, especially the physics faculty, have just worked so tremendously hard to make this program as successful as it can be. Uh, and you know, I have to give a shout out to my advisor, Dr. Mahasby. The work that he's put in to the physics department has been insane. So let's just give him a round of applause. So they can... It was actually under Dr. Mahasby's tutelage that I was able to conduct undergraduate research for about, two, uh, for about one year. And in that one year, I actually managed to publish two separate peer-reviewed articles on two totally different fields of physics in all, in all in one year. First of which being classical mechanics and the second of which actually being a graduate level field, uh, solid state computational physics. As Dr. Klaus said, I was able to take the formula of which to the 2018 April meeting of the American Physics Society which is an international meeting for physicists to come together and present their research. So I applied to give a talk there as an undergraduate student, and I was accepted. And again, as President Klaus said, um, uh, my, I was chosen from about 100 different undergraduate students, and I was chosen, I was given the award of the top undergraduate presenter, competing against schools like Berkeley, MIT, Caltech, UW-Madison, just <laughs> a lot of different schools. And I was given the opportunity, the honor of being the top undergraduate presenter. You know, and I'm, I'm saying all these things, all these achievements, not to boast about myself for some innate narcissistic pleasure or something. Um, I'm saying it because I achieved all these things as a student, but more importantly, as a student at UW Parkside. If you had listed all the things that I was going to achieve these past four years and just put on a piece of paper and given it to me when I was 14, 15, you know, freshman, sophomore in high school, probably would have laughed in your face because I just wouldn't have thought that all these opportunities would show up to me at UW Parkside. If I had laughed in your face, it probably would have been the most ignorant thing that I could have done. <laughs> um, you know, I've heard a phrase being tossed around by some of the faculty recently in the past month or so, or, sorry, the past year. And I'm slowly using it more and more. And it's just, it's that Parkside truly is one of the hidden gems of southeastern Wisconsin. And that's something that I'm unbelievably proud of. It's, you know, just, we've become such an amazing university, or we've actually already, we've, already, we've always been an amazing university. I've just slowly come to realize that within the past four years. So it's kind of my ignorance. But Parkside truly is a hidden gem of south, southeastern Wisconsin. And it's truly thanks to our faculty and staff that we're here today and just being able to achieve all that we can. For any student who shows some motivation, some drive, you can achieve a lot here. There's a lot of opportunities at this school and I'm just proud to be here. So let's give a round of applause to the faculty and staff and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So, uh, Siva, how many of those nearly 30 students that are now physics majors did you talk to during orientation? Um, you know, it's funny that you ask that because uh, so when, we, when a new student comes in for orientation, as an orientation leader, I get to see their current major. So, you know, we had the biology students come in, the business students, communications. And whenever I'd see physics majors, I would just kind of jump up and down with joy. So there's a brand new physics major coming to the school, and I would just get a lot, way too excited. But I'd say about five new ones have come in this past semester. And so I suspect you don't take any credit for those numbers increasing at all, do you? So. I think it would be, I'd love to, but I don't think it would be uh, humble of me to do so. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now for some uh, news from around the system. So I direct your attention to the screen and the boring narrator who provides it. So that would be me. <laughs>
UW Parkside is making its mark in professional sports. Student Andrea Wagner completed an internship with Ford Field, home of the Detroit Lions, and UW Parkside alumnus Dwayne McLean leads business operations for the Detroit Tigers. The school has earned a top five ranking by schools.com for its sports management degree program. UW Green Bay is giving back to the community in meaningful ways. This fall, more than 500 new students cleaned up Bayshore County Park. The campus also hosted the region's annual back to school store, helping to provide 1,500 elementary students with free back to school essentials. The recently opened Pablo Center at the Confluence in downtown Eau Claire is the result of the work of an innovative public-private partnership. The center will host UW Eau Claire's performances and exhibits, as well as other community arts events. The creative arts are increasingly driving economic development in the Chippewa Valley, and were one reason Eau Claire was featured in Time Magazine a couple of years ago. UW Whitewater is launching a new app called Involvio to help drive student engagement from orientation to graduation. Students will have access to class schedules, campus resources, advice, calendar, and more on their phones. About 300 freshmen are currently piloting the app. UW Superior's new Pruitt Center for Mindfulness and Well-Being will become a gathering hub to provide resources, expertise, learning projects and personal and professional development activities for students and employees. The center also promotes wellness by establishing partnerships and collaboration across the campus and within the community. UW Stout's supply chain management program helps Wisconsin companies efficiently move their products through manufacturing and distribution. STEM College Dean Chuck Bomar says supply chain is about creative real-time problem solving. Students Greg Copps and Destiny Wojtek recently had internships at Plexus in Appleton and at Greenheck in Schofield. UW Stevens Point just opened its new chemistry biology building. The building features research and teaching labs with state-of-the-art equipment, lecture halls, classrooms, and even a tropical conservatory. The campus has more than 1,300 students in biology, chemistry, biochemistry, and natural science disciplines. This building, the first major new academic building at Stevens Point 40 years, showcases science and expands research opportunities for students. This year, UW River Falls accepted over $3 million in external grants to fund research and academic programming. This year's grant activities involve 77 partners, including five Fortune 500 companies. One ongoing partnership with John Deere, for example, aims to advance emerging technologies that use big data to help farmers make informed decisions. UW Platteville faculty and undergraduate researchers are developing eco-friendly material for 3D printing. Dr. John Obeliadon, Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering, and Dr. Joseph Wu, Associate Professor of Chemistry are using wood waste extractions to develop a low-cost biocomposite for 3D printing applications, creating an eco-friendly substitute for petroleum-based printing products. Students in the UW Oshkosh Master of Business Administration Executive Program are given the unique opportunity each year to establish international business partnerships. This year's cohort of 24 students visited companies in Stockholm and in Prague. UW-Milwaukee signed an agreement with Foxconn Technology Group to create an international co-op program starting this semester. UWM engineering students will study at a university in Taiwan and work at a Foxconn facility there before returning to UWM to complete their degrees. Nearly 80% of all students at UWM will have completed an internship, student teaching, or other work experience before they graduate. UW-Madison's field days held at Arlington Agricultural Research Center hosted more than 200 farmers, ag extension agents, and industry experts. They learned about the latest research into pest management, fertilizer, drainage, gene editing, and more. The College of Agriculture and Life Sciences regularly holds field days at its 11 research stations around the state to share insight into farming issues. 
UW Lacrosse students get in the field experience right in their backyard. They benefit from hands-on environmental studies classes and internships in the nearby Lacrosse River Marsh. They even research the impact of potential railway spills on microscopic organisms. Their efforts greatly contribute to the region's vigorous economy and healthy environment. Well, as you can see, there are a number of wonderful things taking place on our campuses. Um, another quick update. Last month, we announced that former Governor Tommy Thompson would lead the UW System Business Council. This council, which is comprised of more than, a, than two dozen business and industry leaders from across the state, is designed to foster increased dialogue with corporate leaders and to better align the university with the needs and expectations of employers. We're pleased that Governor Thompson agreed to do this, and he has already, as several of you know, energetically chaired his first meeting. Turning now to 2020 forward, uh, today we present our second annual report. For the benefit of newer regents in 2020 forward, we crafted a strategic framework for the future of the University of Wisconsin. Uh, the, the, the framework is focused on how the university can most directly and effectively help the state prepare for the future. This plan reflects voices from around the state, thousands of folks on campus, off campus, individuals, legislators, community and business leaders who shared their concerns with us, their needs, their ideas and their dreams. It was also created with a deep understanding and appreciation of the challenges facing the state. Today we'll report on the actions we've taken in the last year and the progress we've made on operationalizing the 2020 forward plan. Overall, we're making significant progress and tangible progress across the plan's four main focus areas. The educational pipeline, university experience, business and community mobilization, and operational excellence. To lead today's presentation, I'm going to call on Ben Passmore the Associate Vice President for Policy Analysis and Research. We use the acronym OPAR. Ben? Thank you, President Cross. Um, good morning. This morning, what I'd like to do is work through this 2020 progress report. There's some technical detail on the, some of the measures that we believe show that we are making some progress in these areas. But let me start off by talking a little bit about how we are trying to measure the entirety of this plan. Because it's a very large, very diverse plan, and there are lots of pieces to it. And we want to, particularly as we move towards 2020, to more effectively measure the entirety of the plan. Whether we're succeeding, not simply in kind of immediate areas that, uh, where we know we're taking action, but in kind of the amplification of effort. So I list three things here on this slide that are what I will be talking about today. First is we have areas of special focus within uh, 2020 forward. And these are areas that tend to have standing working groups, are subject of kind of groups of initiatives, and are a major thrusts of the entire thing. These are the ones you've heard about, the 360 advising, the seamless transfer, the core initiative. I'll talk about each of those. But in addition, all of the areas within the 2020 forward plan are areas that we take very seriously. These are things that, as President Cross pointed out, the people and leaders of Wisconsin want us working on. And so we are working on these. We refer to these as areas of amplified effort. That is to say, using general stra using strategies, specific strategies, but using kind of a general push that these are the directions that we should be heading in. And I'll give some examples of that. And then third, we are attempting to use our system of what we're, what we're referring to as interlocking accountability. The University of Wisconsin system is, uh, participates in a number of accountability systems. And in reference to the 2020 forward, all of these systems speak to the directions that we want to head and are reflected in many of the initiatives within it. And so what we want to talk about all of these things in terms of is in terms of these specific sorts of accountability measures that we already do. There should be nothing surprising here because we already talk about all of these things. Now today, I'm gonna to talk about a few critical areas, but all of this is in some ways a preview for a comprehensive report card of the 2020 forward uh, report, which we will have to you for December. 
But today, let me focus on just a few of the areas. Let me start with 360 advising. This is an area of special focus. It's an area where a number of initiatives have taken place, and it's important to our educational pipeline. The question is, how do you know you're succeeding? And there are two ways that we focused on, because there are, again, two ways that are already focused on within our, within our accountability. Are the students moving through in an efficient fashion, reflecting good advising? And are we holding on to the students who enter our system effectively? Now, overall, as I talk about 360 advising, what we'll see is that we are making good progress in many of these areas. But it is slow incremental process, uh, progress, excuse me. Slow incremental progress, and, and this is, is uh, part of the focus of many of the initiatives, it tends to be somewhat uneven across our institutions. Some institutions are going gangbusters, others are having difficulty uh, making the progress that they would like to make. So let's talk a little bit about time to degree, which is what you see displayed uh, above you. Uh, the numbers in, within the bars represent the average number of semesters it takes a student to graduate uh, with a bachelor's degree from one of our programs, having started as a new freshman. We're making good progress on this. Uh, we started about 9.3 9 semesters and have moved down over the course <coughs> of the five years that followed to nine semesters per. And this is part of a longer term trend of trying to make sure our students have the tools they need, are directed appropriately, so they move through quickly. And it represents actually quite a um, major shift that we've seen over the last 20 years, where if you go back, we're talking nearly a full semester, well, we're talking about 10 semesters to, uh, to graduate. Not every institution, as I said before, has been equally successful. The best have, in the last five years, shaved a full half a semester off the average. That may not sound like a lot, but when you talk about all the thousands of students we're talking about, it represents an enormous change. Actually, it would be remiss of me if I didn't point out that the leader in that has been University of Wisconsin at Parkside, which has taken a full half semester off uh, in that period of time. How do we take that? How do we take that well, uh, and expand it beyond help the institutions that have struggled more with this? Well, part of what the 360 advising group is focused on is a policy initiative to bring a 15 to finish program to all of the uh, campuses within uh, the system. That's still in development. Um, it's not been adopted yet. But the idea there is to provide simple, straightforward direction on how to drive uh, students, in, uh, drive students to completing more rapidly. Every semester you take is a chance you won't re-enroll the next semester. So we want to keep uh, focus on that. A little bit less encouragingly, we've seen uh, we have not seen dramatic improvement in retention figures. And that's what this represents here. This is a second measure for 360 advising. Although we have seen a little bump up in the, if you did a long-term trend, we would see the trend line going up. It has been quite uneven across our institutions, with some institutions actually going backwards on, uh, the, on the second year retention rate. <clears throat> Uh, the 360, again, the 360 advising group in the last year has addressed this directly. Uh, there is, they're convening the advising center directors, doing peer training from the, or, from the institutions that have been more successful with some of this. And we have a major um, initiative around using predictive analytics to help further improve this that's in the office. The second area of major, fo or second area of special focus it, within the educational pipeline is the seamless transfer initiative. Now, again, I, I only have the one slide for this, but let me talk a little bit about the number of new transfers, the transfer students that we see within uh, the University of Wisconsin system. About 10 years ago, we were at around 13,500 transfers entering the system each year. That uh, moved up in 2011 and 12 to over 15,000 and then it has moved back down to about 13,500 today. This very much reflects the kind of trends that we've seen overall. At 2011-12, we were still seeing what's sometimes called the baby boom echo, and so we saw increases in enrollment uh, from freshmen as well as transfers. As that demographic uh, wave has uh, moved back out to sea, the, uh, we've, we've seen the numbers dropping again. 
Now, perhaps more telling, because it's not simply transfer, it's seamless transfer here, we wanted to look at whether or not students were, in fact, entering as transfer students and then succeeding. And so what you have in front of you is the four and six year graduation rates of those students. The four year graduation rate has moved up more than two percentage points over the last uh, five years. And the six year graduation rate has done like, as, has moved up two and a half percent. Now obviously with, with transfer students, we'd like to see them move through in four years because they already have uh, credits accumulated. However, it's still, I believe, an encouraging trend when we see their graduation rates moving up, even if it does take a bit longer than, than we might have wanted to. Now, seamless transfer is perhaps the area that has seen the most activity of any of these over the last year, because the, the single initiative action that most affects that is the restructuring. And it will change fundamentally the way our students move from our two-year campuses to the four-year campuses. So there's, we, you, you have had many and will have additional presentations on restructuring, so I won't dig into that too deeply. But parallel to that, the Seamless Transfer Group has been working throughout this year on issues of policy, on issues of curriculum alignment, and specifically we're focusing on data and technology in an attempt to eliminate, again, seamless transfer, attempt to eliminate some of the small traps that students fall into where they can't get their equivalencies easily in a, a, uh, a straightforward fashion or where they have difficulty understanding what transfers and what doesn't. So we're using data and technology to try to uh, alleviate some of those. Let me talk about the university experience. Our major, uh, one of the, the major area of special focus within the university experience is around high impact practices. Now, Again, I know you've heard a little bit about this, but I, I should at least put it in a little bit of context. High impact practices are a wide group of different things that students experience on campus. The most, in, the, the most critical element of which are they have a close interaction with faculty members and are doing something that requires them to think very critically and involve themselves in, uh, in work that is uh, both applied but also requires them to, uh, to, to really take the knowledge they have to a different level. It includes things like service learning, learning communities, internships. Um, it can include research with faculty. There are a number of areas of this. This is so difficult to measure whether or not, student, whether or not we are doing this well. And a big part of the difficult, or a big a reason this is so challenging for us is the specific goal set within the 2020 forward framework was for each student to have two of these high impact practices during the course of their time uh, at, in, at one of our universities. Using survey data from the National Survey of Student Engagement, we have been able to get some kind of baseline. And over a period from 2006 to the present, we have in fact moved from around 82% of our students having one of these high impact experiences to 89%. And you'll note that, that all of the change occurs just over the last couple of uh, uh, administrations of this survey. The most recent data, we were able to extract uh, how many had had the two experiences, which was 67%. So about two thirds of our students are already experiencing this. We're trying to work with this on two levels. One, establish a better method to collect these data. Survey data is always a little bit tricky to work with. You're never quite sure what you're getting. Um, so we're working to establish how you tell if something is a high impact practice on a campus and measure it more accurately. And then secondly, uh, the work on high impact practices has been funded through a Taking Student Success to Scale grant from Nash and I believe Lumina who have worked on, uh, who, who have provided uh, funds to five of our institutions. Those five institutions are being used essentially as a laboratory to develop approaches to this that will then be taken out to scale on our other campuses. Uh, the result is that for this out, with this outside investment, we're trying to figure out how to best approach this and do it in the most efficient fashion. Now, I don't, have a good gra I don't have a pretty graphic for CORE, but CORE is perhaps the, the, uh, the single most influential of all of these areas of special focus in what we're doing. It falls under the category of operational excellence, 
And part of the reason I say it's so influential is because each of those is a major initiative which I could easily spend 15 or 20 minutes talking about. But beyond that, the whole spirit of CORE, the spirit of, uh, of common use of data, common use of technology, common use of services, imbues almost everything we're talking about here. You heard it with the HIPs, the predictive analytics uh, approach that we're talking about for 360 advising. All of these things look to do these things in a more standardized and more cost-effective way, but without losing the uh, strength that we get from our individual institutions. I'll just mention uh, University of Wisconsin Shared Services because I think it is a particularly uh, uh, powerful example of this. It's been launched as a new standalone unit, and it's going to provide human resources, information technology, and procurement services out to our institutions. Again, things that they all have in common, but we often find ourselves doing it in 10, 12 different ways. I'll, I'll assume there's at least two in common, at 10 or 12 different ways. Uh, CORE is, in a lot of ways, a little bit earlier on in this. They've stood up a lot of these initiatives, but we don't necessarily have great measures of whether or not these are being successful yet. By the time, uh, by the, time the next 2020 Forward Progress Report is given next fall, it is my hope that we will have additional uh, information about the level of cost savings and specifically of cost avoidance, which I think is a major part of the core initiative uh, at that time. One more area, well actually it's two more areas, I'd like to talk about. Uh, Wisconsin workforce needs, which is part of our educational pipeline area, and what's called Wisconsin Vitality, which is in business and community mobilization. This is a good example of what we refer to as that amplification because neither of these was picked out as an area of special focus. But neither of these ever left kind of, um, uh, never left the attention of leadership within the system. In fact, all of them have been subject to a whole range of specific sorts of, uh, specific sorts of programs and strategies. To say a little bit about them, Wisconsin Workforce Needs seeks to increase the number of students graduating with the degrees that are most sought after within the state of Wisconsin in terms of both uh, developing the workforce, but also allowing them to move seamlessly into uh, high paying jobs. Wisconsin Vitality specifically focuses on that same sort of goal, but within the healthcare area because that is kind of, it's a critical part of making sure that uh, the people of Wisconsin are well served by our graduates. The collaborative programs, academic, uh, the focus of our academic program development, flex programs, nursing completion programs, there's a whole array of things that have been put in place to help drive this forward. And in fact, this is an area that perhaps sees the most significant progress of any single area or any pair of areas within uh, the 2020 forward strategic framework. And these numbers representing uh, 9,700, if, if you can't read it, 9,700 uh, graduates in STEM disciplines and 3,400 graduates in health professions represent the high watermark, the high point of production in both of those areas that has ever been seen in the University of Wisconsin system or indeed in Wisconsin. Um, this, is, uh, this is tremendous progress and continues to be an area of major focus. Now, part of the reason I end with that is because I wanted to at least briefly preview the report card that we will be bringing you in December. All of the things you've seen thus far are part of that interlocking system of accountability. You will see us reference in this report card specific accountability measures that are associated with each of these. If one doesn't fit, we'll tell you we don't have a good accountability measure that fits for this. But for the most part, we do, in fact, have good accountability on exactly the areas we want. And that has just been reinforced by the linkages to the new OBF measures, the outcomes-based funding measures, which align very closely in many, of, in many instances. There are a couple of, uh, couple of weak points, but in many instances align very closely with the specific efforts listed in the uh, uh, 2020 forward strategic framework. And it's our hope that this will help focus our system efforts going into 2019. Uh, 2020 forward strategic framework, you all may be aware, in about 14 months, it'll be 2020. So we're hoping that we'll be able to speak to this with even greater success 
uh, next year. And I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Regents, any questions? <coughs> Seeing none, let's give our presenter a round of applause. Thanks, Ben. Uh, appreciate that very much. Uh, finally, the Fund for Wisconsin Scholars has awarded approximately 580 new four-year UW System students and 324 transfer students with need-based grants. It is the second year in a row that all eligible transfer students were funded. The Fund for Wisconsin Scholars is a private foundation established in 2007 by a founding gift of $167 million from John and Tasha Mordridge. It provides need-based need grants, which do not need to be repaid, to graduates of Wisconsin public high schools attending public colleges to support their access and completion. Over the last 10 years, the Fund for Wisconsin Scholars has awarded about $65 million to eligible students through UW System's four-year schools and $8 million to Wisconsin Tech College System students. As of this year, the fund has decided to provide awards to UW System students exclusively. We are grateful to the mortgage, mortgages for this important support. That concludes my report, President Bailey. Thank you. We'll go ahead and move on to committee reports. I'll now call on Regent Klein to present the report of the Research, Economic, and Innovation Committee. Madam Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Bailey. Um, yesterday was a great meeting for the Ready Committee. Um, we had two uh, tremendous uh, presentations. We started out um, with a panel of, of uh, four extremely dynamic and impressive young women from University of Wisconsin Parkside, uh, women innovators, uh, students, and they were uh, introduced by their faculty representatives. They discussed the innovative activities and opportunities here at UW Parkside, uh, focusing um, in large measure on undergraduate research. Um, it was very interesting to all of us um, that they were introduced by faculty mentors. Um, and some of the takeaways, I would, I would have to say, I think on behalf of the committee, were that undergraduate research is very important here at, at, uh, within the UW system and, and specifically here at UW Parkside that it wouldn't be possible without faculty members to work and mentor these students, um, that, that the students themselves talked about the importance of diversity and inclusion um, in, in, at this university, and that we can't underestimate, and it was on the previous screen um, in the previous presentation, the importance of high impact practices and opportunities for our students. Um, and I would put, um, yeah, of course that includes internships, co-ops, um, the wide variety of different extracurricular activities, but really important, I think we need to focus on it, is undergraduate research. That's something that helps um, students gain such tremendous experience that is launching for them in their careers. And it's really alive and well on this campus, and I, I want to say we were all extraordinarily impressed with the women researchers, student researchers that we met, and we were also impressed with the level of faculty involvement. Um, the other presentation we had was equally as important and impactful. We heard from um, Jella Trask, who was with the WEDC, um, and she gave us a really detailed update on the WEDC's efforts to assist in the Foxconn development of Wisconsin Valley here, and obviously that's important, and we could all see it as we came down um, to this region and to UW Parkside. Um, we heard about all the phases of development. We heard about the um, you know, what the state is doing to ensure, I guess, on the first phase that the, the construction industry um, is, um, able, from all over the state, is able to participate um, in the economic impact of the Wisconsin Valley development. Um, we also heard about uh, the Innovation Center and the role of Smart City, Smart Future competition uh, here on this campus and across the UW system to hopefully propel innovation that's related to the whole Wiscon, Foxconn development effort. So it was a really good presentation, um, and we were most appreciative of the opportunity to learn from the panel as well as um, the representatives from WEDC. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Regent Klein. I uh, had an opportunity to sit in the Ready Committee yesterday, and the two presentations were fantastic. Uh, first, the four student presenters, uh, Chancellor Ford, 
you have some superstars. They were, they were tremendous. Uh, secondly, with the Foxconn report, uh, great to hear the progress, great to hear over 2,200 Wisconsin employees have already been hired uh, with more to come. So those were uh, two great reports. And I think Regent Tyler had a question. Regent Tyler. Actually, a, a, a comment. Um, if these young women were mid-career and made this presentation, we would have been impressed. Um, the, the youngest, 19 years old, graduating next spring, uh, peer-reviewed articles published, uh, uh, multiple. Um, uh, it was incredible the, the level of engagement and the, uh, the advanced studies that they're doing. And I just, um, uh, uh, we, we were blown away by uh, their presentation. So I just couldn't let it pass without commenting. Thank you. Agreed, and thank you, Regent Tyler. Any other questions on the ready report? If not, we'll go ahead and accept that report. And thank you, Regent Klein. Regent Whitburn, please bring forward a report of the Business and Finance Committee. Thank you, uh, Regent Chairman Bailing. Scott Menke, Parkside's uh, Vice Chancellor and Chief Business Officer, provided the committee with a broad and comprehensive look at how the campus assembles its 100 million each year in revenues, as well as how these dollars are efficiently expended Faculty and staff FTEs have been reduced to about 60 positions here at Parkside over the last half dozen years. Scott has developed a very innovative methodologies uh, for the distribution of dollars throughout Parkside's colleges and programs. This may well be a template for other campuses to consider looking at. For UW-Madison, the committee approved two medical research related contracts one with Worcester HIV Vaccine LLC doing business with our Wiseman Biomanufacturing in a $2 million five-year fee-for-service agreement related to FDA-approved clinical trials for HIV infectious drugs. The other contract is with Servio Technologies, a Boston firm working in partnership with our Department of Geriatrics in Adult Development doing clinical trial data analysis in the Alzheimer's disease research space. The committee also approved and recommended for board approval a change in our ongoing reporting of gifts, grants, and contracts received across our system. As you'll recall, for years, we've seen these reports every quarter. Vice President Nelson has recommended that a reporting schedule of a mid-year and a year-end report should be adequate. In other words, we'll go from four reports a year to two. Uh, the committee agrees and recommends the board embrace that change. Board members will also recall the mandate from the legislature that we report to them annually on the status of our program revenue reserves with campus by campus report on reserves um, that we have in place in the various campuses as of the end of the fiscal year on June 30th and also provide breakdowns to the legislature of reserves that are obligated, planned, and or designated for specific use. Our total unrestricted assets in program balances at the end of the fiscal year was 907 million. It was up 55 million from a year ago. The report that we're submitting indicates that 78% of the total are either obligated, planned, or designated for specific use. The committee also received the year-end financial management report. This report has been evolving here over the last four years since then President, uh, uh, Regent President Falbo called for its uh, establishment. This past year, the system revenues were 270 million stronger than budgeted in June of last year for fiscal 18 while expenses came in 22 million uh, below the budgeted levels. We received an update from Kathy Mayer on progress that she and her information security team are making in establishing priorities, planning enterprise investments, and ongoing and upcoming initiatives. Is IT security an ever-increasing risk across our system? You bet. 
but the committee feels very positive about progress that we've made this past year in strengthening our hand in this critically important arena. Sean Nelson shared with the committee preliminary distribution information about our outcome-based uh, funding provided for the first time in the state budget. He expects that this $26 million will now be distributed to campus, various campuses later this month. Vice President Kramer also updated the committee on the system's shared <laughs> services project. He informed the committee that we can see the rubber meeting the road on this initiative beginning on July 1st. <clears throat> As you know, two of our regents are not voting on contracts right now, so let me first move adoption of resolutions 12C and 12D, approval of the two contracts before us. Motion and second. Any questions or discussions? <laughs> Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion thank passes and thank you. Thank you. Now let me move approval of resolutions 12D and 12E, covering the remaining actions that the committee took. Second. Motion and second received. <laughs> Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Chairman. Now I'll we'll turn to Regent Regina Milner to provide a report of the Education Committee. Uh, thank you, President Bailey. I'm pleased to report on the, uh, the activities of the Education Committee. First, the committee unanimously approved a Bachelor of Science in the video production at UW-Stout. This degree elevates an existing minor in photography and video to a major in video production. The pro program responds to workforce demand for graduates in rapidly expanding fields in which video production is needed for internet and multimedia distribution. In support of the major, UW-Stout received more than 10 letters of support from employers, including representatives of DreamWorks Feature Animation, Film Wisconsin, and the Milwaukee Filmmakers Alliance. Um, I want to make a comment about this. Uh, it was, it, this is the first time in the system that we've had a video production that wasn't within the arts department. This is actually within a technical department and it's, uh, it's for business purposes only. And it, re it, it responds to a, a need in, in the market and it responds to a unique need that isn't being served at any other institution. So I was very, we, we were all very pleased with the market study and with that in particular information. Second, uh, Chancellor Van Galen and Provost Davis sought approval for the UW River Falls revised mission statement. UW River Falls successfully completed the process for gaining approval for its revised mission statement. The revisions were unanimously approved by Faculty Senate, Student Senate, Academic Affairs Council, and the University uh, Staff Council. On August 24th, 2018, the Board of Regents completed its first reading of the revised statement. On the September 13th, 2018, our own Regent, uh, Regent Mark Tyler facilitated a public hearing on the revised mission statement, which was featured in a news story published by the River Falls Journal. So you got some good press. We did. Therefore, the Education Committee recommends the Chancellor and Provost, rec uh, com commended the Chancellor and Provost on their excellent work and unanimously approved the revised mission statement. Third, we heard a report from Interim Vice President Karen Schmidt, who provided an informative update on the UW System Restructuring Initiative. Notably, Vice President Schmidt will present to the full board on the restructuring at today's meeting together with Vice President Kramer. Next, the committee spent a considerable amount of time discussing our teacher education initiative. Um, I'd like to just review what we've done over the past four months, just briefly review so you know. I want you to know that online, you have an executive summary of those four months. We've also videotaped it, so you have an opportunity to see them if you're interested. 
if you're interested, and I have copies if you're interested. I put so much emphasis on this because we've worked for four months on this uh, teacher education initiative, and we intend, we are creating a task force that's going to be looking at some serious, Im the implications and some uh, and some ways to deal with those implications of the upcoming teacher shortage. This is an important initiative from the Education Committee, so I apologize for taking a little time to review it. I want you to remember that uh, in February 8th uh, of 2018, we had, thank you very much, Regent Evers, we had the process for improving educator preparation programs leading to licensure which was presented by Dr. Shields Briggs from uh, the state of Wisconsin, Department of Public Instruction. So we did that in, on, on the 8th to find out about licensure. Then on, in April, we had an overview of 20 plus years of UTeach and its impact, which was presented by Dr. Marianne Rankin, who's the provost of the University of Maryland at uh, College Park. That gave us an idea of a different way to prepare, uh, to prepare special teachers in our high school areas, in our particular our STEM areas. And finally, uh, and then on, uh, in August, we had Building a Strong Teacher Workforce in Wisconsin, which was presented by four deans from the UW System uh, Schools of Education. And finally, uh, I'm mistaken. I apologize. That was in August. We did have another one in June, which involved our uh, provost from UW Extension, UW Milwaukee, and UW Stevens Point and Superior. And that was in June. And what they explained to us was the university's uh, academic array for teacher education programs. That was followed up by the deans. Recommendations came from the provost, came from the deans, and they're all included in the executive summary. We wanted to take this time at our education meeting to discuss what we had heard before and to more or less frame some things that we wanted the task force to be doing. So in order to inform that analysis, I invited the provost from each of the UW institutions to join us at the meeting table, and we had a good discussion. During our discussion, we considered steps forward to increase the enrollment in UW colleges and schools of edu and colleges of education, reduce student loan debt and time to degree, which was an important discussion piece, and it was an informative discussion piece from the perspective of the, pro of the provost. Meet workforce demand for teachers, especially in high need schools, raise public esteem for the teaching profession in Wisconsin, increase retention of teachers in the profession. Third, we, uh, um, from, from those, from those, um, excuse me, I have my, our, the last two areas that we discussed were increased in certification of teachers in specialized areas and decrease the need for emergency certification in Wisconsin, especially by offering more summertime and online professional development opportunities for teachers. That completed our discussion, and we went on to hear from Provost Rob Dukoff, who delivered an pres excellent presentation entitled, Recommitting to our Vision, Renewing the Academic Plan to Lead UW Parkside to 2020. Um, for that reason, uh, I would like to uh, move the following resolutions for adoption by the board. Resolution 1.1b it is approval of the Bachelor of Science in Video Production at UW-Stout. And Resolution 1.1c, second reading and approval of the proposed UW-River Falls select mission change. Second. Motion and second. Any questions to discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Does that conclude your report? That concludes my report. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We'll now turn to Regent Style to your report of the Capital Planning and Budget Committee. Chairman Style, the floor is yours. Thank you, Regent President Bailing. Since the Audit Committee didn't meet this week, I think we can all agree that Capital Planning and Budget was the most exciting committee of the meeting. 
Oh, that, that said, my report will be brief. The Capital uh, Planning and Budget Committee approved the following two resolutions, 13B, brought by UW System on behalf of UW-Madison, requesting authority to complete the design and construct of the $1.1 million gift-funded UW-Madison College Library restroom remodel project, which expands and remodels the restrooms on the three floors that house the College Library and Helen C. White Hall. Uh, to meet modern building code requirements. The college library is one of the busiest libraries on campus, and restrooms presently do not have enough capacity to serve uh, faculty, staff, students, and library patrons. Resolution 13C, brought also by UW System on behalf of UW-Madison, requested authority to complete the design and construct the 1.4 million gift-funded UW-Madison Memorial Library and UW Press Remodel Project uh, the remodeling will allow UW-Madison to relocate UW Press back to campus and thus reduce co future costs by eliminating the need for a lease. UW Parkside uh, presented the committee with uh, information about capital planning and budgeting for student success, and Alex Rowe, uh, Vice President Alex Rowe, updated the committee about cost containment measures. Um, I then move Resolution 13B and 13C. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. That concludes my report. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. We'll go ahead and move on to the next item on our agenda. Item number nine. When the board approved the UW colleges and UW restructuring, I committed to the board that this would be a standing agenda item for the next six meetings. Time went fast, didn't it, Edge? Today's the sixth report. But much has been accomplished since our last meeting. And to tell us about it today is Vice President Karen Schmidt and Vice President Rob Kramer. If those two could please join us and good morning to both of you. To report that on September 4th, the fall 2018 semester classes started on the, on the branch campus, now administered under the academic and administrative oversight of the seven receiving institutions. After the board approved branch campus names in August, several campuses held campus convocation and community ceremonies to celebrate the beginning of the fall semester and the arrival of new campus signs and school colors, which reflected not only their new campus names, but new opportunities for engaging the university with their branch campus communities. As we reported to the board at our last meeting in August, the University of Wisconsin System Administration is preparing for a six month report and follow up visit by the Higher Learning Commission, our accrediting agency, which we refer to as HLC. This site visit is to evaluate progress toward the goals and objectives outlined in our restructuring application. UW System Administration, led by Associate Vice President Carleen Vandizandi, is working with the HLC accreditation liaison officers at the receiving institutions to prepare content for the written report, which will be submitted on October 15th in advance of the site visit, which is scheduled for December 3rd and 4th in Madison. The report to HLC will include restructuring progress information on areas such as support services to students, planning and budgeting, and continuity of educational programs. The HLC visit will be held in Madison and will provide the opportunity for the UW system to demonstrate in a single visit our progress toward the full integration of all the branch campuses. In news on the transition of faculty and updates, the UW System Office of Academic and Student Affairs continues to monitor and support the faculty transitions that have re resulted from the restructuring of UW Colleges and UW Extension. Related to the UW Colleges faculty, the board formally memorialized the transfer of faculty tenure from UW Colleges to the receiving institutions in Resolution 11049 at the board meeting on June 6th, 7th and 8th uh, this summer. This resolution preserves and recognizes the tenure that the UW College faculty had earned prior to their employment being transferred to the receiving institutions on July 1st. Restructuring also transferred UW College's tenure track faculty members to the receiving institutions. Tenure track faculty members hold a probationary appointment until there is an institutional decision on tenure. Since the July 1st restructuring moved forward, staff from the Office of Academic and Student Affairs and the Office of General Counsel 
have met with each of the provosts on the receiving institutions to discuss the institutional transition plan for tenure track branch campus faculty members. Each receiving institution now has in place a plan for the tenure and promotion criteria by which their branch campus tenure track faculty will be evaluated. <coughs> Similarly, the Office of Academic and Student Affairs is now working with the UW College of Services and the receiving institutions to identify and develop a transition plan for UW College's emeritus faculty so that the recognition of this appointment can be transferred to the receiving institution as a result of the restructuring. At UW-Madison, the planning for the UW Extension faculty tenure transition continues. This month, the UW-Madison Faculty Senate began to consider a resolution related to the transition of tenure for the faculty of UW Extension. And within UW System Administration, our offices are now involved in significant efforts to implement the integration of UW Extension personnel and programs. Programming units that are transitioning into the system administration structure <clears throat> include continuing education, outreach, and e-learning, the Institute for Business and Entrepreneurship, the Wisconsin Humanities Council, the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, and the Instructional Communication Systems Team. Leadership teams are actively working with the restructuring project management teams to ensure a smooth and successful transition of these units into system administration by July 1st, 2019. I'll now turn it over to my <clears throat> colleague, Rob Kramer. Thank you. Um, this actually is a summary graphic uh, <clears throat> of a number of things that are going on with respect to the transition of services. As you may recall, the January 2017 application to HLC indicated that services to branch campuses would be provided under an MOU in phase one of the restructuring. This took effect July 1st. And here's a summary of the services by group and when receiving institutions will be taking over responsibility for that service delivery. Several services listed in groups one to three have already transitioned to the receiving institutions. We're also working to expedite a number of services shown on the right with some campuses moving faster on particulars related to those. Our goal throughout this continues to be providing uninterrupted services to students, faculty, and staff during this year while we have an orderly move to the receiving institutions of this work. Looking forward, we've already started planning to sunset the remaining administrative operations of UW Colleges and UW Extension. We're organizing this around assets, financials, compliance and records, and staffing. Over the next three months, We'll identify owners for each area of the sunsetting work, identify key communication needs, and complete implementation plans for all categories of activities. The HLC submission with its phase one and phase two, along with the MOU, will guide and inform this work. As an example, in the area of assets, we're organizing the work into three categories, real estate, information technology, and property and equipment. Each category is going to have an owner who's responsible for the complete and orderly sunsetting of activities and ultimately signing off on the conclusion of all the work. I think that completes our prepared update. Thank you. Are there any questions by board members for our two vice presidents? Any other questions? I do, I do have one question for the board. Since this is the, the, the sixth report, the final report, what's the board's preference in terms of, is this, is this an item you want me to uh, bring up at a future meeting, say the, the December or March meeting? Are you comfortable? I know I'm very comfortable with, I think this transit, um, I, I think this uh, transaction for lack of a better term has gone immensely smooth. Uh, I'm particularly appreciative of, of the chancellors in terms of how they've got out into the regional communities uh, and gave assurances that this was only going to continue to make our programs better. So I'm comfortable, but any preferences on the board? I do have Regent a Delgado. preference that we continue to have a uh, presentation. And the reason for that is that this is significant enough that thank God is going extremely smoothly, which we should celebrate. Okay, we shouldn't just get news that are really bad, so thank you very much to everybody involved. But unless you report, we won't know. 
Okay, and one day we'll find out it's all been done a year ago, and then we'll say, my goodness, that went so well. I'm sorry, we'd like to know how well it is going. So my idea is keep the pace going for as long as a significant transition is going, because we need to know. Well stated, and I'll make sure it's on a future agenda. Regent Milner. Uh, I agree with that, and, and I, like it. I like the fact that it's succinct. And by having a, having, having a uh, periodic update, we, it, we, it can be a brief report. And if we've got any additional questions, I've got a couple of additional questions, but I don't want to ask them here. They're, they're sort of housekeeping questions. But that, that keeps it front and center. This is one of the biggest things that we have done as far as a structural organization in a very long time. And I think if not just for us, because we can ask internally also for the public at large to know just have a, just a, a periodic update. I think it's a good idea. Well stated. Thank you, Regent Milner. I'll go ahead and make that commitment. If there are any other questions, let's give our two vice presidents and President Cross a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. We'll now turn to item number 10 on the agenda. We have a report on the continuing progress being made in developing policies related to personnel files and reference checks. As you'll recall, at our previous meeting, the board unanimously approved a resolution calling for the UW system to develop or modify human resource policies to ensure a more robust hiring and reference check processes related to sexual harassment. To lead today's report, our very own UW Systems General Counsel, Quinn Williams. Quinn, good morning, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Regent President Bailing, uh, President Cross, uh, Vice President Peterson, members of the Board of Regents. At our last meeting in August, you asked that we come back to provide an update on our progress in moving forward towards implementing the policies developed as directed by the Board regarding employee personnel files and reference checks which required the development or modification of certain human resource policies for all UW institutions regarding documenting sexual harassment allegations and investigations, maintaining personnel files and conducting reference checks, and exchanging personnel files between all UW institutions and state of Wisconsin agencies. Today, we will cover the UW system policy comment period implementation documentation, ongoing tasks of the work group and stakeholders, articles and coverage on this issue, remaining timelines, and a summary of the draft UW-Madison policies before you that meet the requirements of the Board of Regents resolution and that are consistent with our draft UW system policies, which will be covered by Mark Walters, Senior Director of Operations of the Office of Human Resources at UW-Madison, and Patrick Sheehan, Director of Talent Acquisition and Retention at UW-Madison. Following our August Board of Regents meeting, the work group developed an online comment form open to all UW employees using our standard University of Wisconsin System Administration policy comment process. This form was distributed on September 17th and was open through today. Additionally, shared governance groups working through their individual campus leadership and human resource directors have until October 31st to submit formal group comments, uh, which is outside of the standard UW system policy comment process. This timeline was necessary due to the frequency of various meeting times for shared governance to ensure we received appropriate input. The work group is continuing to draft documentation to ensure a smooth rollout, including frequently asked questions, PowerPoints, and other training materials, a list of institutional contacts for personnel transfer process, and a list of institutional contacts for the reference check process. Other ongoing tasks of the work group include uh, working with the Department of Administration to clarify procedures and processes for sharing personnel files between UW institutions and state agencies, researching options for electronic storage of personnel files, and soliciting feedback on implementation advice from national professional organizations. 
By way of example, Senior Associate Vice President and Chief Human Resource Officer for the University of Wisconsin System uh, Human Resources, uh, Dr. Shanita Brokenberg will be presenting the background of our draft policies and answering questions and the keen interest she has been receiving from a number of her Big Ten colleagues at the up upcoming Big Ten Conference of Human Resource Officers. Also, since our August meeting, there has been increasing interest outside of our Big Ten colleagues, and we have included some of those articles for your reference, including a recent article uh, by Inside Higher Education, which we have included in your folders. Uh, we believe this highlights the board's unique, first-of-its-kind approach nationally on this issue. And as you'll see in this slide, we remain on track for our timeline, with an anticipated implementation date in January of 2019. Next, I'll turn to Mark Walters, Senior Director of Operations for the Office of Human Resources at UW-Madison, and Patrick Sheehan, Director of Talent Acquisition and Retention at UW-Madison, to talk about Madison's policies. Good morning. So as far as with UW-Madison, we have gone forward and drafted policies that are in parallel with the UW system UPS policies to meet the Board of Regent resolution as far as the intent. Uh, one of the areas that we drafted as far as a personnel policy, that uh, our personnel file policy that we did not have in the past. We had a, a, a group of policies that, that, that got at that, but we consolidated into a a personnel file policy uh, that incorporates those provisions. And we also had a current policy uh, as far as recruitment assessment and selection that um, basically creates the reference check aspects of the, um, the commitments that, uh, that we're going forward with, us, again, to meet the Board of Regent resolution. And so what we've done as of, uh, as of uh, the last few weeks is that we've enga engaged our campus stakeholders as far as the development of these policies, Talking about the logistical elements, you'll notice the policies that were provided to you do not identify the procedural aspects of how we're moving forward to meet those, uh, um, those provisions, because there's a lot of things under the hood that we need to work through, uh, but we're, we're really having a lot of discussions as far as how we're going to operationalize those things uh, on a large campus as far as UW-Madison. We've, we've also um, talked with a number of stakeholders as far as the changes, possible changes that could be made to the policies. Nothing uh, I would say that's a real substantive, but we've really started that engagement similar to what Quinn talked about as far as talking with various uh, um, governance groups, uh, our, our shared governance groups, our human resource communities, our, uh, our basic uh, uh, administrative areas as far as going forward. We also are making sure that the new policy provisions and the procedures will nest within some of the things that we've done recently as far as our hostile intimidating behavior policy as well as all the Title IX efforts that we're going forward with because we want to make sure this all works together uh, as we go forward. And uh, as, as mentioned, the, the requirements that are in the UW system UPS policies uh, very much parallel what we've implemented, or I should say what we're going forward with as far as the drafts uh, for UW-Madison. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Patrick Sheehan, who will go over the, the two areas as far as the policies. All right. Thank you, Quinn. Thank you, Mark. Um, I just wanted to briefly uh, kind of go over the two um, policies that we're discussing here. Uh, as Mark mentioned, we've moved forward and drafted a personnel file policy. Um, what we previously had were, th were uh, several other different policies for various uh, employment categories that we've used this opportunity to develop a single comprehensive policy that applies to all employees at UW-Madison. Um, and we've worked closely in parallel with UW System to ensure that the minimum requirements of the, UW, of the Board of Regents Resolution and the UW System policy, um, they are both in alignment. Um, so we've identified that violations of sexual violence and sexual harassment policies, those must be placed in an employee's personnel file and may not be removed. Um, second, that if an employee leaves during an, an active investigation, uh, that those into sexual harassment or sexual violence, that that matter would remain in the personnel's, individual's personnel file until that, uh, that investigation has been completed, at which time it would be removed if unsubstantiated, but would remain if it was found to have been in violation of those policies. Um, additionally, we've, we're in the, pro in the process of developing 
uh, practices that allow for the personnel files to be shared with other UW institutions and state agencies, as well as uh, in working closely with Quinn, uh, ensure that there's consistency between the elements uh, that are found in employee personnel files across the UW-Madison as well as UW system. Um, you, uh, just a bit of information about our electronic personnel files. We, we began um, implementing an electronic personnel file system, uh, I think, back in 2008. Uh, we currently have about 70% of the campus um, on an electronic personnel file system, and we're working towards 100% compliance with that. We have over 1.5 million pages of, uh, of personnel file information stored digitally at this time, and we're, we uh, plan to have that process of digitization completed by the end of 2019. And that should allow for uh, um, these personnel files to be shared amongst system institutions and other state agencies in a, in a quick and efficient manner. Uh, next, I'd like to just briefly discuss the reference check policy. Um, it, as Mark mentioned, in, in 2015, UW-Madison implemented a robust recruitment, assessment, and selection um, policy, which provided guidelines for hiring across UW-Madison. Uh, we've reviewed that policy and have made a number of additions uh, to that policy to strengthen areas as well as to provide uh, clarity about areas that weren't previously discussed in, in those policies. Um, in particular, we've uh, ensured that uh, the disclosure of policy violations of sexual violence and sexual harassment um, shall be disclosed to any employer um, that if it wants the university is contacted, contacted for a reference check. Additionally, um, reference checks are, are conducted at UW, for all UW-Madison's hires and inquiries should be made about sexual harassment and sexual violence during the reference check process, as well as asking the candidate about their, their current or past um, uh, violation of, the, of those areas. Um, and so, as, again, as Mark mentioned, we're working closely with our, with our stakeholder groups, particularly our human resource reps and managers and supervisors across the campus to ensure that there's processes in place to ensure that reference check information is correctly shared with, uh, with future employers and that the appropriate information is sought out before making a hiring decision. So, return to Mark. So this next slide just identifies, uh, similar to what Quinn had, as far as our timeline for implementation. We've already talked about as far as August and in September, as we've talked with uh, various stakeholders, developed these draft policies. In October, uh, we're going to continue to work with uh, the various uh, uh, areas on campus, the various stakeholders, to polish these drafts, figure out all of the, uh, the logistics for implementation, uh, incorporate any of the feedback that we receive. As a matter of fact, Patrick and I were meeting with governance groups last week where they had some good rec good areas that uh, for some possible modifications. And so we're going to be doing that in October with November, incorporating the, the feedback uh, as well as working out all of the logistical issues to make sure that this is followed uh, across the area of Madison. Uh, as, you, as you may know, we have uh, thousands of supervisors on the Madison campus. We have to make sure that that all works through, including developing the training and the job aids and everything else that would be needed to successfully implement this. In December, we're going to be finalizing all those things and putting everything in place as far as uh, all the things that are needed to, to march towards a January implementation date. Uh, we've identified as the, uh, that as our target date for all the things that need to happen, uh, including the ongoing, tra ongoing training that would need be needed for those supervisors and managers for things like the reference checks and all the activities that would occur uh, to make sure that, uh, that, that we, that we um, meet the Board of Regent resolution and ensure that we um, safeguard our campus community. So I guess that would be opening up for any questions. Thank you, presenters. Regent Whitburn. Thank you very much for a very helpful discussion of a difficult, challenging, and of course very important matter. <coughs> um, largely, Quinn, we've heard the Madison story. Are we going to have a kick forward implementing these new policies effective the first of the year on all of the campuses as well? Yes. So let me give you um, a real world instance um, over at Stout in Chancellor Myers' office, he has an employee whose behavior is inappropriate and he or she is terminated as a result 
of that behavior. So we have a substantiated matter and it's in the file. Mm -hmm. The person drives down 29 over to Chancellor Van Galen's campus and applies for work. Um, what I'm interested in is who owns the responsibility on the various campuses to make sure that we don't repeat what we had occur a couple of years ago in the system. Uh, thank you for the question, and they both do. Uh, there is both a requirement for the uh, entity that is uh, hiring to ask questions with respect to uh, onboarding that new individual. Uh, so that is a requirement as part of the reference check process. Prior to a final candidate being hired, they have to ask whether or not they were ever found to have violated a sexual harassment or sexual violence policy. It is also the requirement of the uh, donating institution to ensure that that documentation is appropriately included in the personnel file. That is a mandatory requirement uh, for all new hires or transfers. My question is a little more specific. Is it the senior HR person on the campus who owns this responsibility? Where does the ownership, where does the accountability lie? Yeah, and uh, it, likely it's going to be the senior HR uh, director on the campus that would be delegated to. Uh, there is some flexibility on some campuses where they want to know whether or not the HR function for that particular issue is housed with Title IX, uh, but for the most part it should be the HR directors. Thank you. Other questions, Regents? Regent Creeby. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, first of all, I'd echo Regent Whitburn and commend you for the thoughtful and prompt attention that you've given this, which is much appreciated. Quinn, when we first uh, broached this topic, one of the uh, items that was discussed was ensuring that in pursuing a good policy that's the right thing to do, that we don't inadvertently increase unnecessarily potential liability and risk to the UW system for other claims. So my first question is whether you're comfortable that the direction this is heading is going to also address that concern. Yes, uh, very comfortable. Thank you. Second question, uh, and I think it goes somewhat to what Regent Whipper was talking about. In order for this to be effective, it's got to be practically uh, workable. Uh, and I guess I'd also ask, uh, especially our uh, guests from UW-Madison, whether you're comfortable that the procedures that have been laid out are going to work in practice and will be streamlined and effective enough uh, that we'll accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. One thing I'd note, and this isn't an argument, but I'd note, for example, that there is now a prohibition on any confidentiality or non-disclosure, or would be prohibition on any confidentiality or non-disclosure provisions in settlement agreements, um, which has obvious merit as a reason there, there's a reason to do that. Do you have any concerns? Have any concerns been raised regarding how this is going to work in practice for it to be effective? Well, I'll talk for UW-Madison. I, I, so we've had a lot of discussions over the last few months as far as how we can make this work. Because Again, very large decentralized campus for UW-Madison. And so I think we've come up with some solutions to make sure that it will work and that we can do things in a, in a streamlined way so that when I talked about the, the thousands of supervisors that we're going to have to train, that that's basically just training them to make sure they know that they, they need to make certain statements about this and that we're going to triage the more sensitive things within our office of, central office of human resources so those will come to us to make sure that they're done right. And, and as well as there are a number of other things that we do to vet candidates, including criminal background checks and other things like that, to make sure that we're utilizing the, those processes to help with this process. So as far as your first question, I believe that we will be able to operationalize this effectively and so that it, it's, it's doing what we want to do, want it to do as far as meet the intent, but not become overly burdensome as far as that, because when it becomes overly burdensome, then things don't happen the way they should be happening. And so I think we, I think we have that covered. In regard to the non-disclosure and the other things, I, I, would, I would refer to, to uh, uh, Quinn as far as the legal aspects of that. And I would say for confidentiality, generally speaking, uh, we're not allowed, 
at least in the state of Wisconsin, confidentiality agreements uh, rarely withstand uh, challenge to our public records law, so I don't think we're uh, giving up much there. And uh, non-disclosure agreements are generally very difficult to enforce and are nationally, I'd say, disfavored now, particularly in light of the Me Too movement, so. Thank you. Regent Delgado. Uh, I have a question that perhaps was addressed when we first spoke about it, but you can remind me. Does the individual that is affected by one of these reports, and we just talked about the fact that if the individual leaves the, the organization before the completion of the report, the report, the, the investigation continues and a report is made, is the individual informed that such a report is in the file and the results of the report? Uh, yes, uh, and, and in terms of uh, uh, a standard disciplinary process, those disciplinary notices, whether it's for sexual harassment or other forms of discipline, go into someone's personnel file, but that is also part of the training aspect for the Title IX coordinators and also for HR directors to ensure that they are aware that, yes, upon final disposition, that does go into your personnel file. And the individual is told about the result. I'm, I'm trying to confirm. Yes. Just to make sure. Very yes. Good. Other questions? Bridget Mueller. Thank you, Mr. President. Could you clarify the criminal background check process a, a bit, and if it will, the timing of it will change in any way as a result of these new processes and procedures? Well, I, you know, I can speak for you to Madison, but we have uh, we have a pretty robust criminal background check process where, uh, when we go through the hiring process and we get to the finalist phase, that. For most of our positions, there is a requirement for criminal background checks. And so what happens is we, we have an external vendor that basically conducts those checks and, and corresponds with that finalist, asks them a series of questions in regard to uh, whether they've ever been convicted of, of, of a crime, and then goes out and does that criminal background check. And then those results come back to what we have in the Madison campus. We have criminal background check coordinators that then work with the Office of Human Resources to review those results and make determinations whether there's a, there's a substantial relationship between the conviction and the job responsibilities. And so that, that's generally the process we have for the Madison campus. And so what we're really looking at for this, uh, for implementing this area as far as the questions that Quinn has talked about before with their finalists, seeing if we can utilize some of that process to get at the questions to the finalists about these things. Again, we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't determined that that is the strategy that we're going with this, uh, but we're, we're looking at all those options to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, so that we can make it a, a, an effective process, but a process that will work within our, our hiring, um, our overall hiring process. Part of the idea is to, uh, as part of the criminal background check process, in many cases you let candidates know right up front there will be a criminal background check as part of the overall hiring process. You let them know early and often. Similarly, that strategy could be employed as it relates to putting them on notice there will be questions related to sexual harassment and sexual violence. And that allows some candidates to uh, uh, self-correct or decide to withdraw early if there's, a, if there's an issue. Thank you. Other questions? If not, let's give our presenters a round of applause. <laughs> the next item on our agenda is a presentation from Chancellor Debbie Ford and Director of Athletics Andrew Gavin. They'll be providing a report on the philosophy of NCAA Division II Athletics in an update on UW Parkside's recent move to join the Great Lakes Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, and of course, an overview of UW Parkside's athletic programs. Chancellor Ford, the floor Great. is yours. Thank you, Regent ba Bailing, and uh, thank you again for joining us for our celebration of student success, innovation, and our 50 years at UW Parkside. Uh, just a couple housekeeping keeping items in your packets. Um, we would like to invite you to join us for lunch today. This uh, particular card in your packet or my assistant Jean has more if you would like to join us for lunch downstairs following the meeting. And just a note for those regents unable to attend the session on Wednesday evening, the box and the puzzle that you have inside your packet was made 
and designed by our students and our faculty in our digital design and fabrication lab. And so this is a very special piece, and we want you to know that uh, it was made um, in your honor um, as a part of this meeting. So take that and know that it is uh, from our students and our faculty here at UW Parkside. So thank you for that. And uh, before I introduce our amazing athletic director, Andrew Gavin, I just want you to join me again in thanking everyone, um, particularly the leaders of our team that put our meeting together, Jean Herbcheck from my office and John Milkey also. And John, you have to know, is the one who made sure we had a TV last night with the Brewers. So let's give everyone at UW Parkside a big round of applause. And, and Siva, I, I'd ask that you stand up again if you don't mind, because I have heard from a number of students that UW Parkside is not their first choice, but it is their best choice. So thank you for being one of our great students and helping us not only to be a hidden gem, but to be a shining gem. So again, thank you, Siva. So it is my uh, pleasure to introduce to you Andrew Gavin, our Director of Athletics, who has been a part of our uh, UW Parkside team since August of 2017. Um, in his role as the, uh, the Director of Athletics, he oversees 15 varsity sports um, here. He joined us uh, from his alma mater, Center College, where he served as Associate AD for Advancement and External Relations. He also served as Assistant Director of Athletics at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, so we were very happy to have him come back to Wisconsin. Um, and he began his career at the University of South Carolina Aiken and also worked at Central Florida. So Andrew has had experience at all three divisions of NCAA Athletics, Divisions 1, 2, and 3, and we know that he has found his home here in Division 3 Athletics. Um, Andrew is a, is a uh, native of Madison, Indiana, which is right across the river from Kentucky, my home. And uh, his wife, Ashley, is from Kentucky, and they are the proud parents of two wonderful children, Peyton, who's two and a half, and Wyatt, who just celebrated his birthday earlier this week. Um, Andrew serves as a member of my leadership cabinet and has successfully led Ranger Athletics through significant change this past year. We've joined the Great Lakes Intercollegiate uh, Conference, and we've welcomed 30 new employees to the athletic department, including three administrative positions and 14 graduate assistants to build capacity. Um, and that is in line also with our growth in graduate programs. Ranger Athletics is committed to enhancing our student athlete experience by building a strong structure for NCAA compliance, providing increased educational opportunities and access to resources for our student athletes in important areas such as academic support, sexual violence prevention, diversity and inclusion, eligibility requi requirements, and all areas of health and wellness. I can tell you that we remain committed to maximizing and efficiently utilizing our resources while also identifying areas of need and opportunities for growth to support our student athletes and our coaches. As you know, UW Parkside holds a very unique place in the UW system and state as the only Division II institution. And Andrew will share more with you about Division II and our move to the Great Lakes Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, as well as some important initiatives within Ranger Athletics. But I also want to share with you, given our conversations yesterday um, with our, our colleagues at UW-Madison, is that Division II institutions have more in line and more similarities to Division I institutions in terms of compliance um, and requirements than our Division III counterparts. We are focused on health and safety, student-athlete welfare, and sexual violence prevention. I want you to know that I served five years from 2012 to 2017 on the NCAA Division II President's Council, and I also had the opportunity to co-chair important committees. And so I understand the importance of making sure that we provide the best experience for our student athletes. And here at UW Parkside, I can honestly say that our students are meeting those Title IX requirements as well, um, and would be happy to answer any questions that you may have following Director of Athletics, Andrew Gavin, presentation. So, Andrew, thanks for being on the UW Parkside team. The floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Chancellor Ford. 
Um, as she mentioned, my name is Andrew Gavin, and I have the privilege and honor of serving our student athletes in our university as the director of athletics here at Parkside. I have been in this position, which is my first opportunity to be an AD, since August of 2017. And not to be redundant, but my previous experience has included work at all three NCAA divisions, including another Division II public school, two years in Orlando at UCF, one of the nation's largest institutions, five years within the UW system at UW-Green Bay, and most recently at my alma mater, a private Division III liberal arts school in Central Kentucky. Through the diversity of these experiences, I've been fortunate to witness the varying roles intercollegiate athletics plays in positively impacting an institution. Through student recruitment and retention, campus pride, branding and visibility, alumni relations and fundraising, and most importantly, student success and engagement. Each of these diverse experiences shapes my work here at Parkside. You will see on the left side of each of these slides, our Ranger Bear logo with the phrase Ranger Impact or hashtag Ranger Impact on social media. This has been a focus of our department since my arrival just over a year ago. I was attracted to this position at Parkside because of the opportunity that existed for me and more importantly for our athletics department to have a positive impact on our student athletes, our institution, and our community. Impact, as we define it, in Ranger Impact stands for inspire others, mindful of mission, positivity, progress, and people, appreciation of differences, commitment to community, and telling our story. As I arrived at Parkside and over the course of the past year, I quickly learned a lot about Parkside Athletics and Division II, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning to tell our story. UW Parkside, as you heard from Chancellor Ford and may have known previously, is the state of Wisconsin's only NCAA Division II institution, private or public. I heard a lot about that during the interview process, once I arrived, and today, even this morning, in a conversation. But what does that mean? What is Division II and how does that impact UW Parkside? In many areas, Division II, as Chancellor Ford mentioned, carries more similarities to Division I than it does Division III, although we are more likely to get confused with our system counterparts in Division III. Being the Lone Ranger in Division II, pun believe it or not unintended, <laughs> located in the southeastern region of the state can have its challenges, but the opportunity to compete as a member of Division II presents our institution and our student athletes with many more positives and opportunities than negatives. Some key characteristics of Division II include high-level competition, academic excellence, life in the balance, and affordability. And I want to share some information on these characteristics and how they align with and impact Parkside. Division II athletics is highly competitive, featuring some of the top collegiate athletes in the country, regardless of division. While it is certainly not the norm, there's a long list of Division II student athletes that have achieved success as professionals and or Olympians which speaks to the division's athletic talent. At Parkside, we offer opportunities for approximately 250 students annually to compete in 15 NCAA sports. We offer athletic scholarships to many of our student athletes, with every single one of them being partial. At Parkside, these span from covering as little as 2% of the full cost of attendance to, in a small number of cases, as much as 90%. As one of only five institutions in the state, public or private, to offer NCAA scholarships, UW Parkside provides some of the best student athletes in Wisconsin the opportunity to stay here within our state, earn a scholarship, compete at a high level, and of course pursue their degree. The Division II regionalization model for NCAA championships is unique to Division II, as it provides more access for student athletes to compete nationally at the championship level than the other two divisions. Approximately one of eight student athletes at the Division II level enjoy the opportunity to participate in the NCAA championships each year. Additionally, Division II is the only division which hosts a festival, which is an Olympic style event in which a number of national championships are held at a single site over a period of days. At Parkside, our student athletes have taken advantage of this opportunity to enhance their experience and achieve significant success 
In the past decade, 13 of our 15 sports have seen individuals and or teams compete in NCAA championships. Our wrestling program's history includes 15 individual national champions, including recent graduate and current graduate assistant coach that you see on your left, Nick Becker. An example of Parkside's success attracting transfers, Nick finished his career last March with an 89-0 and zero record after claiming his third straight national championship. In the, in the past decade, our women's soccer and women's basketball teams have advanced to the Sweet 16, and our men's basketball program has reached the NCAA tournament in five of the past six seasons. Division II student athletes and student athletes at all levels generally perform at higher levels academically than campus-wide student populations. In Division II, student athletes have average graduation rates of 6% higher than their student body counterparts. At Parkside, this number averages nearly 20%. This is in part because NCAA eligibility rules are designed to ensure students have declared a major and are on track to graduate. Parkside student athletes are high performers in the classroom. Our student athletes regularly achieve a grade point average cumulatively above 3.0, and last year, 42 Rangers were named to the Division II Athletic Director Association's Academic Achievement List, recognizing them for being at Parkside for at least two years and maintaining a grade point average of 3.5 or higher. In addition to adding diversity to campus in many other areas, Parkside Athletics helps bring diversity to our campus community through the recruitment of out-of-state and international students. Nationally, Division II is comprised of more first-generation student-athletes than any of the other divisions, which of course aligns with the mission of our institution here at UW Parkside. Division II has utilized the mantra, life in the balance, for more than a decade. Life in the balance defines the philosophical foundation of Division II, supporting our student-athletes' ability to pursue their academic, athletics, and personal goals. Our season schedules are structured to allow our students to develop their skill and ability, become highly competitive and decorated student athletes, but with shorter seasons, balanced off-season workouts, and no mandatory summer workouts. This ensures our student athletes can pursue work and internship opportunities, study abroad, and engage in our campus and our community. As one of the most important elements of Division II, community service is a key portion of every national championship. Our student athletes at Parkside have committed to serving our institution and our community through their own personal interests and passions, as well as the intentional initiatives of their teams, the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, and the NCAA. On your top left, our soccer teams just last weekend through the Make-A-Wish Foundation welcomed two young people to campus to enjoy our games as special guests and meet our student athletes. Nationally, Division II is committed to supporting Make-A-Wish, and we are thrilled to have that impact on young people in our region. The bottom left shows an event that our Student Athlete Advisory Committee held on a Sunday last spring, meant to just hang out and interact with a group of 30 plus Special Olympians from our community. On the right, our softball team, volunteering recently at the Kenosha Boys and Girls Club, which is an organization that our coaching staff and student athletes within that program are incredibly passionate about. Finally, I would add that right now, this week, our student athletes are sponsoring Mental Health Awareness Week on our campus, hosting a number of events, distributing informational packets and resources, and selling t-shirts to bring awareness around this important issue. This idea and initiative was driven by our Student Athlete Advisory Committee and our president, senior volleyball player Katie Adams, and their work this week and through all of their community service has been inspiring and commendable. Affordability is also a key characteristic of Division II. Almost all Division II institutions are funded in large part through institutional funding sources, including tuition revenue and student fees. Partial scholarships, which I mentioned earlier, <coughs> excuse me, help institutions control costs much easier than Division I counterparts. Partial scholarships also mean that student athletes are paying at least a portion of their tuition, room, board, books, and fees. And the majority are paying student fees, board costs, and other, excuse me, 
which generates revenue for the institution. At Parkside, student athletes contribute tuition revenue of more than $1 million annually. They fill more than 20% of the beds in our on-campus housing, generating an additional source of nearly $1 million. And the majority are paying student fees, board costs, and other fees. Rising costs for travel, officials, uniforms, facility maintenance, and equipment combined with stagnant budgets have created financial challenges. And it is critical now more than ever at Division II, and especially here at Parkside, that we are able to identify alternative revenue sources for operating budgets and facility improvements. At Parkside, a significant source of this revenue is generated through external facility rentals, with many of them bringing prospective students to our campus. Our nationally recognized cross-country course will alone host more than 50 high school and collegiate races this fall on 15 different dates, with approximately 7,500 runners crossing the finish line. In the past year, we have launched the Ranger Impact Fund and the Rise Up Rangers Challenge to facilitate philanthropic giving to our student athletes and created the Parkside Athletics Corporate Partners Program to foster collaborative relationships with local businesses and generate meaningful dollars. Our 12 current corporate partnerships have already created significant impact on our athletics department through cash revenue and in-kind services. This is highlighted by our sports medicine partnership with Aurora Sports Health, which started on August 1st, 2018, after an RFP process through the state system. Aurora, one of the nation's largest healthcare companies, provides our athletics department with two full-time employees and access to a network of physicians and resources. This partnership is critical to ensure our student athletes receive high quality and comprehensive medical care for their health and wellness needs. So, as the only Division II in Wisconsin, if we can't compete against opponents within our own state, who do we compete against? For years, nearly 25, UW Parkside was a member of the Great Lakes Valley Conference where we were the northernmost school and in the minority as a public institution. Just over a year ago, our institution announced the decision to become a member of the Great Lakes Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, or the GLIAC. On July 1, 2018, this membership became official and we are competing as a full member of the GLIAC today at 2.30 this afternoon on campus actually in women's soccer. I reference being in the minority as a public institution in the GLVC. In the GLIAC, we are in the majority, as nine of the 12 institutions are public, including seven regional comprehensive state institutions in Michigan. The GLIAC aligns us not only institutionally and philosophically, but geographically. Now we travel within our region and with schools with more brand recognition within our own state, including Michigan Tech, Northern Michigan, and Grand Valley State. Many of those institutions already recruit heavily in Wisconsin because of their ability to offer Division II competition and athletic scholarships. A few weeks ago, our women's soccer team welcomed Northern Michigan and Michigan Tech to campus one weekend and competed against 13 Wisconsin natives. As a member of the GLIAC, we position ourselves for better recruitment in our own state due to more brand affinity with GLIAC schools and easier travel for some families within our own state. We will certainly have our work cut out for us in the GLIAC, as the conference is perennially among the nation's best. In the past three years, the GLIAC has claimed six national championships, including Ferris State this past season in men's basketball. Grand Valley State, located in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area, has inarguably been the best athletics department in the nation for the past two decades. Grand Valley State has claimed the Learfield Cup trophy awarded to the nation's top all-around program in 12 of the past 15 years. We are excited about our place within Division II, and we are in our recent bold beginning as we are excited to begin our time in the GLIAC. I'm proud of our strong history of su success athletically and academically and the progress we've made over the course of the past year. I'm just as excited about the future focus of Parkside Athletics as we tackle challenges and opportunities. This photo of our main competition court in D. Simone Gymnasium is an example of how we are improving our facilities through branding and renovations as we unveiled this beautiful court this past summer. It also shows where we need to go 
because we have prioritized replacing the wood bleachers, which are nearly 40 years old. We are also in the process of creating a master plan for our outdoor facilities with an eye on student recruitment, student athlete experience, revenue generation, and community needs and reputation. Last fall, as Chancellor Ford mentioned, we were considering how our athletics department would navigate through challenges, how we were structured as an organization, and what our needs were for capacity building to better serve our student athletes. We identified an opportunity to align with the institution and add graduate assistants to serve in coaching our staff roles. On August 1st, 14 graduate assistants that you see here began in our department. Seven in coaching positions, two in athletics department positions, and five others that have split duties working within the Sports and Activity Center while also serving as teaching assistants in our sport management program. We are really excited and proud of this initiative because it represents alignment with the institution's master's program in support of their growth, highlights collaboration with our sport management program, helps build capacity and efficiency for our staff, and creates high impact employment and educational opportunities for our master's students. These three head coaches represent our staff changes in the course of the past year, well, 10% of them. Since August 1st, 2017, we have hired 30 new employees into either full-time or graduate assistant roles within our department, which represents 75% of our staff. In each of these three searches specifically, we were fortunate to attract high quality, talented young people to Parkside for the opportunity to become Division II head coaches for the first time in their careers. However, in each case, we had assistant coaches from Division II institutions or head coaches from Division III institutions within our own state withdraw due to our compensation packages, which highlights our need to improve in this area to enhance recruitment and retention of our coaches and staff. All of this work in Parkside Athletics, what we have accomplished, and more importantly, what lies ahead, is centered around progress and support. How are we progressing to attract talented young people to Parkside? How are we progressing to support the academic, athletic, and personal development of our students when they arrive on campus? And how are we progressing to support the goals and initiatives of our institution? We are so fortunate to have the support of Chancellor Ford and our campus leadership as we focus on these goals. And we are excited to continue to make progress towards our bright future in Parkside Athletics. Thank you to President Cross, the Board of Regents, and the UW system for the opportunity to tell our story this morning. Go Rangers. Board members, do we have any questions for our presenter? Seeing none, thank you again for thank your you. report. Chancellor Ford, did you have anything else for us? Thank you. thank you, Chancellor. Let's go to item number 12 on the agenda. I'll now invite Regent Gruby to present a resolution of appreciation to UW Parkside. Thank you, President Balin. Uh, before I do that, I just wanna take a moment to thank Chancellor Ford and her whole team again for thanking uh, for hosting us. Uh, these past few days. I know I'm not speaking just for myself in noting that not only is it always a pleasure to visit this campus, but that any time any of us do, we find something new and really impressive about what's going on here. Uh, the focus on student success and innovation is clearly paying very real dividends. So congratulations. <laughs> I would note one other thing, though. Uh, this morning, we heard Siva Shankar say something that I know I've said, and I've heard any number of people say, and that's to describe Parkside as a hidden gem. I'd propose that at the beginning of your next 50 years, we stop hiding what you're doing here. Um, uh, Siva uh, exhibited great humility in talking about his own accomplishments. We shouldn't be so humble in boasting about what you're doing here. So with that, Whereas, the members of the Board of Regents are pleased to recognize the University of Wisconsin Parkside as the official host campus for the Board's October 2018 meeting and are grateful for the generous hospitality extended this month by Chancellor Debbie Ford and the entire Ranger community. 
And whereas the board appreciated hearing Chancellor Ford's presentation on valued partnerships, bold beginnings, future focus, and whereas the Education Committee thanks Provost Robert Dukoff for his presentation titled Recommitting to Our Vision, Renewing an Academic Plan to Lead UW Parkside to 2020, and whereas the Research, Economic, Development, and Innovation Committee heard a discussion by Chancellor Ford and a student faculty panel highlighting women scientists who are using the opportunities available at UW Parkside to advance innovative ideas, and whereas the members of the Capital Planning and Budget Committee heard information about UW Parkside's capital planning and budgeting for student success, and whereas the Business and Finance Committee heard from Scott Menke, Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration, who presented on financial management for student success, giving a high-level overview of budget, staffing, initiatives, and collaborative activities with other UW institutions, and whereas the board was delighted to hear from this month's student spotlight, Siva Shankar, who is a UW Parkside physics major, major and was voted the best undergraduate presenter at an American Physics Society meeting last spring, and whereas the board appreciated being invited to tour the UW Parkside Digital Design and Fabrication Lab at the Rita Talent Pick and Regional Center for Arts and Humanities. Be it therefore resolved that the Board of Regents hereby thanks UW Parkside for this month's informative presentations, its forward thinking and innovative spirit, and its many continued con contributions to the UW system and the state of Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Gruby. Are there any communications, petitions, or memorials? On behalf of the UW system and the Board of Regents, we would like to express our condolences to the family, friends, and colleagues of Robert M. O'Neill, who passed away earlier this week at the age of 83. Dr. O'Neill served as president of the UW system from 1980 to 1985. He was also a law professor and a nationally recognized scholar focusing on the First Amendment, free speech, and the press. He will be sorely missed. Any other communications, petitions, or memorials? Seeing none, once again, thank you, Chancellor Ford. It's always a tremendous opportunity to come to your campus. With nothing else, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.